Lisa. He's the preeminent researcher in the world in the study of neural network approaches to reading and increasingly many other phenomena in language. Um, he's a, an exemplary member of the cognitive science community combining uh, powerful mathematical and computational modeling techniques, experimental psychology, neuropsychology. It's a very powerful research program which has had a huge impact. Uh, they've got his uh, BA in 1984 in cognitive science and math at uh, Rochester, and then his PhD in 91 in computer science at Carnegie Mellon. He's currently associate professor in the psychology department at Carnegie Mellon and a member of the Center for the Neural Basis of Cognition uh, of Carnegie Mellon and University of Pittsburgh. Um, I have these here because I wanted to uh, give you some indication of, of uh, the ways in which we're fortunate that Dave has taken time to visit us because he's a very busy man. Um, so since, night, since the year 2000, Dave has published articles in Cognitive, Affective, and Behavioral Neuroscience, Journal of Experimental Psychology, Learning, Memory, and Cognition, Journal of Experimental Psychology, General, <coughs> Cognition, Psychological Review, Language and Cognitive Processes. And as you can see, uh, we have the great fortune of, of uh, having him take time from his busy schedule to let us know what he's been doing lately. Um, I hope that uh, you'll have a chance to get a sense for how exciting this kind of research can be when it's done by somebody who really does it well. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to have a chance to talk with you all. Um, speaking on the day before Halloween, I was tempted to come in costume, but in retrospect, uh, I decided my talk was scary enough for at least some of you. Um, the, a theme that runs through my work is to try to show that um, if one adopts a certain computational framework, uh, certain computational principles, uh, then um, one can formulate explanations of cognitive and neural phenomena that might include less built-in structure than you might a priori have thought was necessary to account for the data. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about a series of simulations um, largely focused on language acquisition uh, that, was, uh, done, that were done uh, in collaboration with uh, Doug Rohde who's uh, finishing his PhD in computer science and will be uh, soon taking up a postdoc with uh, Ted Gibson at MIT. Um, let me just quickly cast uh, what I see as a contrast between two different views on language. Um, most of this will be familiar to many of you. Uh, on one view, language learning consists largely of acquiring a grammar for a language, and that knowledge is uh, largely isolated from other kinds of cognitive processes and knowledge. Uh, including certainly pragmatic and semantic knowledge uh, on current theories, less so lexical knowledge. Um, and learning language involves identifying the particular grammar of your language. Uh, this problem is under constrained by the linguistic input, uh, in fact provably so, uh, at least under arbitrary positive only uh, presentation. And on the basis of this, one has to bring to bear innate constraints that are specific to learning language uh, that allow one to constrain the search space in identifying uh, the grammar of one's language. Another perspective, uh, which I'll call the statistical view, not that there isn't statistical information used in the first approach, says, focuses on the fact that language, the language environment has very rich distributional regularities uh, in the inputs provided to children in the speech surrounding children. Um, it's true, or at least arguable, whether children receive much di direct corrective feedback, um, but no one argues, uh, as is implicit in Gold's proof, that language input to children is intentionally adversarial, designed to prevent children from learning language. Um, moreover, there's no, on the behavioral level, there's no need for users of a language to identify the exact correct grammar, single common grammar. Rather, what's necessary is that people can communicate. That is to say, their language knowledge has to be sufficient um, to largely avoid misunderstanding, but might vary. 
Moreover, there need be no sharp distinction between what we think of as language specific knowledge and more general extra, uh, extra linguistic knowledge. Um, and the effectiveness of learning language presumably involves uh, not only the structure uh, available, the, yeah, the statistical structure available in the input, but also the kinds of knowledge the learner is bringing to bear, um, both language specific knowledge uh, as well as this extra linguistic knowledge. Um, and a particular idea, which is not unique to us, although we're going to use it uh, uh, in a number of contexts, is that one can use the rich distributional evidence uh, information in linguistic input to provide a kind of implicit negative evidence. Um, because, and, and one way to do this is by constantly making predictions about what occurs in the world. Because every time you make a prediction, the world provides feedback as to whether that prediction was accurate. And if you revise your language knowledge to improve your predictions, of course you won't be fully accurate, but you can improve your predictions. Um, the, as you become more accurate, you necessarily are having to capture and represent the varying types of knowledge uh, involved in generating this input, language knowledge of people who have learned the language. Um, and the hypothesis we're going to explore is that this kind of implicit prediction combined with biases on learning that are domain general is sufficient to account for the kinds of structure we see in language. Now, of course, I'm not going to be able to make that case airtight, um, but I am going to try to illustrate it uh, in a number of contexts. So uh, with any luck, I will get through four points, uh, each of which I'll talk about a particular simulation. Um, the first two I'll try to go through relatively quickly. Um, the first is how do we, it's fine to say there's rich statistical information in the input. What kind of mechanism is actually going to be able to learn from such information and use it effectively? It won't surprise you that I think connectionist neural networks are uh, one important candidate here. Um, it will turn out that um, the implications of looking at that carefully uh, will undermine a particular uh, possible account of why there are critical period effects in language acquisition, so we still need an explanation for why those would arise. Um, moreover, if we're relying on statistical information, how can we capture what look like hard constraints, not just graded weak constraints, which uh, by just learning from statistical information. Um, and then finally, um, although it might be useful in, in, in a sort of in demonstrating uh, learning language structure from statistics to be doing this kind of prediction, what role does that play in actual language comprehension and production? Kids are not going around saying, you know, generating predictions. Um, and yet if we're going to use that type of means of acquiring knowledge, we need some, we need some way in which that can be embedded in an actual account of language comprehension and production. So let's turn to the first. Uh, there was some seminal work done by Jeff Elman training what are called simple recurrent networks. These are networks that more or less map inputs to outputs but can learn internal representations and hold on to internal representations over time uh, so as to make, uh, generate outputs that are conditioned not just on the immediate input but on previous inputs and the representations, uh, things that are relevant. Um, he trained this network on sentences generated from a very simple grammar, um, which uh, was intended to illustrate certain difficult aspects of English. It obviously isn't a, uh, much of a grammar of English at all, but it does have long distance dependencies. It has number agreement. It has variable verb argument structure. Um, and in order for the system to learn stru this structure, it has to uh, pick up uh, on these contingencies. Um, he trained the network simply given each word as input to generate a prediction of the next word in the sentence as output. The next word came, was compared with the input, was compared with the prediction, and the error was used to improve the network's uh, performance. Um, and what he found in the first case was basically he could get this to work. Okay? Now he doesn't actually provide much information in his papers on how well it worked, but in any case, um, it seemed as if at least it was possible for the network to learn to make reasonably accurate. Of course, you can't be perfectly accurate because the grammar is stochastic, but reasonably accurate uh, predictions about upcoming words and sentences. 
The interesting thing from the current point of view is that his original attempt failed. The standard attempt failed. What does that mean? Well, the natural thing to do would be to just generate sentences from this language and present it to the network and train it. And he found that didn't work. Um, rather, what he had to do was somehow um, structure the training environment of the network so as to only present simple sentences, sentences without embeddings for a while, and only gradually introduce more and more complex sentences with embeddings. He also found that he could get a successful simulation if he left the training corpus alone but made the recurrent memory of the system, its ability to hold on to context, noisy in the beginning and only gradually improve. That has a similar effect because it's only on the, as, as not having embeddings, because it forces the network to listen only to local dependencies. If there aren't any long distance dependencies or relatively few, that's all the information in the input. Or if the memory is faulty, the network has no way to remember the long distance dependencies. All of that feedback is noise. And the only possible things the network can learn are the, the shorter range dependencies. So Elman called this the importance of starting small, of either having limited memory or a limited training environment um, was necessary for recurrent networks to learn the kinds of grammatical structure that English has. This finding turns out to dovetail very nicely with the hypothesis Lisa Newport put forward, which she termed less is more, which was that the limited cognitive resources that children bring to bear that children have actually turn out to be helpful in language learning rather than a hindrance. Again, because the limited resources force the children to pay attention to the most salient local dependencies. And only after they've mastered those do their cognitive resources, resources extend to allow them to look at more complicated structures. Now, when Doug and I first looked at this, um, we knew of other work that had shown that the ability of these types of networks to learn long distance dependencies was aided considerably if the embeddings were partially informative of the, the dependency. Okay? And this was not true in Elman's simple grammar. The embeddings were essentially unrelated uh, in large part to uh, the characteristics of the matrix clause. Um, and it seemed to us that that was not a very representative characteristic of natural language. And in fact, um, a simple form of this contingency relates to semantic constraints. If you have an embedding, um, the properties of the embedding are usually related to the things they're modifying in a, in a coherent way. So we decided to investigate the extent to which this necessity of starting small um, would be mitigated to some extent if the language included these kind of uh, semantic constraints. Um, it is, the simulations are largely a replication of Elman. Uh, we varied, uh, we introduced some uh, what are essentially constraints on verb argument uh, fillers, uh, the way nouns and verbs co-occur, um, in a very loose way. And we varied from uh, a grammar where this was not included at all to a grammar where such constraints were 100% reliable um, and made some changes which, of which we thought were relatively minor kind of improvements in uh, technical details. And like Elman, we compared two different training regimes, one where the full language is trained on from the beginning, another where it starts out only on simple sentences and then gradually increasing proportions are trained. What we found was that there wasn't an advantage for starting small. Um, if anything, there's actually an advantage for training on the full corpus. And that advantage um, marginally increases as a function of how reliable the semantic constraints are. Um, this puzzled us a bit because we actually intend, we, our expectation was to replicate Alman, but perhaps find that the effect was diminished. Uh, whereas, in fact, we found uh, largely the opposite effect. The fact that it, this uh, introducing semantic constraints 
improves training on the whole language was consistent with our basic hypotheses that that was an important part of uh, helping learn across long distance dependencies. So, we went on to do a whole set of uh, detailed simulations that were much closer as direct uh, rep uh, replications of element as well as we could looking at various factors. Um, and a particular one turned out to be critical, namely the magnitudes of the initial random weights used in the network. Um, it turns out that the ones we had used were relatively large. Elman had used very, very small ones. If you look at the error of a network trained as a function of ma random weights on this task, on a task, the gamma that's exactly identical to Elman's, you can see there's this very sort of striking plateau that networks are stuck on for progressively longer as a function of having smaller and smaller random weights. So our network didn't hit it at all because we had nice strong random weights, but um, weights that only are that large extend out to here and weights as large as Elman used never get off that plateau. So our hypothesis is Elman found a failure in, learn in starting large because he used two small initial random weights and those initial random weights multiplicatively shrink the error derivatives in backpropagation. They diminish the degree to which incoming weights can change as a function of feedback, effectively rendering the feedback ineffective. Okay? This is not a fundamental limitation of connections networks in learning language. This is a problem with the particular instantiation of that simulation. Okay? So, our conclusion from this is that um, yes, having semantic constraints does increase the ability of networks to learn these simple kind of pseudo natural languages, um, but even without them there's no real need to start small. Rather, the network already starts small. That is to say, when the network starts out, its context representation, the information it has about what's come before it, is really unstructured. It hasn't learned anything. And so it's largely driven by kind of the word to word predictions. As it becomes good at those, the internal representations capture them and now it has available to it slightly longer distance dependencies. And so the, the, the standard way that these networks learn is that they gradually build up sensitivity to longer and longer range dependencies. Um, and this isn't something one has to build into the system or the training environment. It's something that happens, it's sort of intrinsic to the type of network. So our failure to replicate Elman in some sense undermines the computational support it provided for the less is more hypothesis, right? One idea was kids learn language well because they have limited resources. We're saying, well, networks learn well with full resources. They inherently learn well. So if we're not going to support the less is more hypothesis for critical period effects, what's our explanation? Why should early language learners learn better than late language learners. Well, we decided to look at um, an example of this phenomenon in, a very, in more or less an analogous way, partly for comparison purposes. One example of this phenomenon is second language learners. Okay? And one can compare the efficacy of learning a language after as a native bilingual or as a late bilingual. And the general finding is late bilinguals are much worse. Um, now, we can talk in detail about the data, and I think the data are not uh, as clear as um, prior to a critical period, there's no effective onset, and then there's some rapid decline, and after the critical period, there's no effective experience. I think there's some very compelling data by James Fliggy and others showing that that's probably not the case. But in any case, it's certainly true that overall, late learners are worse. So we decided to explore this in a bilingual simulation where in addition to the kind of grammar we created for English, we created an analogous grammar for German. Okay, we actually did this for a number of sort of pseudo other languages, but I'll show you just the results from German. Um, here the vocabulary is different. Some of the grammatical constructions are similar, but there are some differences in the grammatical constructions, more or less mirroring differences between English and German. Um, in this simulation, 
Um, we're actually using phoneme-based representations on the input and output rather than word-based uh, representations. Um, that's partly because uh, we want to deal with inflections a bit better, but I don't think that that's a fundamental difference. Um, we compared three training regimes. One is standard monolingual training, just like we did in the first simulation. It'll either be trained in English or German. We'll sample, in this case, six million sentence presentations from some large corpus of sentences. Okay? We can compare that with, with what I'll call a native bilingual, which is someone who gets as much language experience, but this experience is drawn from two languages. So there are two corpora of 50,000, one for English, one for German, and we're sampling six million sentences, but every 50 sentences, we potentially switch to the other language. So you hear English sentences for a while, then you might switch and hear German sentences for a while, switch back and so forth, okay? Um, we'll compare each of these, uh, or rather we'll compare it with um, what I'll call late bilingual, which is someone who's trained like the early bilingual, but just had prior to that a lot of monolingual experience. Okay, so we'll first train a monolingual and then that, that network will move to Germany or, vice, or, to, or to America. And half of the time continue to use the native language, half of the time uh, hear the new language. Okay, now. There's one other change which we're still investigating the basis for, but it turns out standard backpropagation does show a pattern a bit reminiscent of what I'm going to show you, but not nearly as strongly. The change we introduced turns out to be related to uh, a tendency for networks to reinforce existing representations. It makes, it makes backpropagation a bit more like heavy in learning, although it's still error correcting and it needs to be to learn the task. What we did was we scaled the derivatives we get at the output units by the activations of output units, okay? And that turns out, if you look at the, the equation, um, to more or less look like uh, introducing a Hebbian term on the output side. Um, the way we'll test it is we'll simply look at monolingual performance and native bilingual performance. The late bilingual um, will test on some new sample from the second language. So I'm showing you the second, the performance of the native late bilingual on the second language, okay? And every, all the results are counterbalanced for English or German. And what you see is the native monolingual learns rapidly just like the first simulation. Native bilingual on, tested on one of the languages is slightly worse, um, but not terribly so. But being a late bilingual, is much worse than being a native bilingual. Effectively, the network prior to this point in training had learned the other language and now has a much harder time reversing all that knowledge or incorporating into all that knowledge performance on the second language. It does certainly improve considerably and uh, one could argue whether that's an asymptote or not, and one could argue whether it should be, but in any case, it's showing a very strong critical period effect, what, what would effectively be a critical period effect. Much worse late learning than early learning. Um, one can also look at how much monolingual experience you need to show a critical period effect. Turns out there's some very interesting data, this is mostly in phonology now, um, from Nuria Sebastian Gales looking at Spanish Catalan bilinguals where um, a child would be raised in a monolingual home for maybe a couple years before uh, entering a bilingual daycare. Um, and it turns out those, those three-year-olds or two-year-olds that had a bit of monolingual experience are worse at the second language phonology than, the native, than kids who were bilingual from the beginning. So if there's a critical period effect, it's showing up at age two which is a bit early for most theories. In the model, um, it turns out even a little bit of initial monolingual exposure does start to impact the network learning. So um, similarly to these kids, the model doesn't show, unlike classic <coughs> theories, but like the kids, the model doesn't show insensitivity to some early amount of exposure and then rapid 
uh, deterioration, it shows incremental impact of early monolingual performance. So, what's the basis for critical period effects? Well, rather than necessarily reflecting some maturational change, <coughs> it may reflect a, a tendency for representations um, to be what's called entrenched. Um, this is Virginia Marshman's term. That is to say, the representations become increasingly committed to doing what they're already doing in such a way that makes them less flexible in adapting to a new task that has to be coordinated. Okay? And um, in this context, there's no particular need uh, to introduce additional maturational assumptions. Not that there aren't maturational changes in the brain, it's just that these kinds of behavioral data may not implicate them. Okay. <clears throat> This type of system um, learns based on the distributional characteristics of the environment. It's doing this implicit word prediction. Um, there are kinds of linguistic phenomena um, that, are, that don't look statistical, that don't look like you could derive them from distributional characteristics of the input, and yet people seem to behave very categorically about them. Um, one example uh, is constraints on WANA contraction. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Basically, um, you can contract uh, want to into wanna in various contexts, except uh, if uh, on the standard theory, uh, subject extraction would have left a trace and you can't uh, contract across it. Um, these are behavioral data from two studies. One, uh, where you're eliciting kids to ask these questions. You ask and you look how often they um, produce WANA incorrectly. And the answer is uh, very rarely. This is a behavioral study where the constructions were designed so that the response isn't the production task of saying WANA. It's selecting a relevant object. So in a particular story, you can ask, which one do you want to help? Or which one do you want to help, which is ambiguous relative to whether you're helping or it's helping. Uh, it turns out in this case, the um, preference of WANA, interpreting WANA in a context of subject extraction is somewhat higher, but still uh, much lower relative to uh, non-contracted forms. Um, I won't read the quote other than to say Steve Crane believes this has to be an eight. Not that anyone else has to believe it. Um, to look at this, um, the hypothesis was that we need to look very carefully at the distributional characteristics that would enter into our knowledge of how want and want to uh, and want to behave. Um, and uh, to do that, we took all the child directed speech uh, from the child's database that involved the verb to want um, and uh, designed a, one of these sort of pseudo grammars to generate those structures in roughly the proportions that we found them in the data. Okay, so it turns out that um, want to occurs about 45 percent. Well, as you see, these distributions of occurrence. Lots of child-directed speech of questions, um, and there's a range of types of questions. The relevant um, types of uh, constructions are cases that involve wanna, uh, or could, or do involve wanna, where it's subject extraction and or object extraction and don't, this is a case where uh, you always see want to, but then you never observe wanna. It turns out there actually are a few instances of what is supposed to be the illegal uh, construction in the corpus, but they were not included in the training. Um, this is a network uh, fairly similar to the last one. It actually maps phonology uh, onto the phonology of the subsequent word. It actually is also doing word prediction, but it, it's still a predictive network using phonology as part of the basis. We needed to use syllables here because we need to be able to code the, the similarity of wanna with want to, right? So there has to be some basis for that. So they are similar. I think, they, I think we coded them as having the same first syllable and a sec, different second syllable. Okay? Um, it's trained on a set of sentences derived from this grammar. Uh, and then tested on uh, 5,000 other sentences not derived. Um, we compared its 
predictive error, this is actually training error or testing error, on four types of sentences, two that, one where wanna is uh, allowed, two with the official, uh, the non-contracted forms, and the red line, which is the uh, illegal contraction. Uh, you can see uh, very early on the network uh, more or less has a very hard time uh, coping with sentences that uh, have the illegal contraction. It also has a bit of a hard time uh, partly because of frequency with the non-contracted form. Um, if we translate this into some grammaticality measure, uh, which we used it actually in the original work uh, and use here, which is sort of based on accuracy of prediction. We actually use um, the two worst predictions because sometimes the point of grammaticality might introduce some problems, but the actual impact of that might occur downstream somewhere. Um, it turns out if you derive a measure based on the accuracy of the network's predictions, it can very reliably discriminate between sentences that are ungrammatical contractions of wanna relative to occurrences of want to and grammatical contractions of wanna. So at least on the basis of the statistics in the corpus that we train this network on, we can explain why children don't prefer wanna as interpretations of other people's sentences in subject extraction, nor in their own speech, without uh, making recourse to innate constraints on knowing you can't uh, contract across a trace, uh, but rather on the basis of the similarity of that structure, and the lack of similarity of that structure, to other constructions the system has to learn simultaneously. Finally, let's talk about the role of implicit prediction in actual sentence comprehension and production. The three simulations I've talked about thus far all use this prediction task. And we don't really think that's what, that's certainly not all of language comprehension and processing. And it may not even on many theories be part of it at all. In fact, many of the criticisms of elements work with that this is all well and good, but it doesn't have anything to do with actual language processing. Um, so how do these kinds of results fit within a more general theory? Um, the fourth simulation involves training a network on sequences of words as input to map up to some representation of sentence meaning, okay? Which I'll talk about in a second. Um, the network simultaneously, while it is comprehending sentences, it is also generating predictions over an output system of subsequent words, okay? So the, hy the hypothesis is that as kids are listening to sentences for meaning to understand them, they are also constantly trying to anticipate the upcoming input, okay? We know that that kind of anticipation will help the system pick up grammatical structure. That's what the first simulations show. Um, and it will turn out that uh, in addition to that benefit, they, this kind of prediction task will provide a kind of indirect training for production, okay? One of the challenges in understanding language use is to understand how kids learn to produce language based on the kinds of feedback they get, okay? Now, a particular, a particular aspect of this challenge are what are called late talkers. These are kids who actually don't say very much till, till three or even four, and then relatively rapidly come out with fairly complex kinds of utterances. It can't be that those kids are deriving that grammatical complexity in their utterances based on feedback from the utterances themselves. It comes on too quickly. It has to be that their language learning in production was driven by comprehension, this extended period of comprehension with little overt production. So there has to be some way that simply learning to comprehend language um, allows you to derive a grammar a derived language knowledge that can be effectively used in production, okay, without training on production directly, or at least largely without training on production directly, okay? So let me explain uh, a little more detail on the particular simulation. 
The grammar here using this simulation is substantially more complicated, although the vocabulary is still very small. Um, but it has um, embeddings, uh, actives and passives, various kinds of prepositional phrase attachments, and so forth. Um, in fact, this is a preliminary simulation that Doug Rohde has extended even in his PhD work um, to be an uh, even, uh, even better approximation to actual English. Um, but in any case, uh, this preliminary work um, is capable of generating sentences which um, are certainly beyond what I can understand um, in terms of complexity, although obviously these very long sentences are very rare in the training corpus. Um, but it has much more of the complexity of grammatical structures in English. Um, one of the challenges in building these kinds of models is how to operationalize the task of sentence comprehension. What does it mean to comprehend a sentence? Um, there was some earlier work by uh, Mark St. John and uh, Jay McClellan where they answered this question by saying, well, we don't know how sentence meaning is represented. But we do know that however it's represented, it allows people to answer questions about the situation described by the sentence. So if we learn a representation for sentence meaning by forcing the network to use its representation to answer all the questions, if the network's successful at that, if it can do all the thematic role assignments, for instance, then we indirectly have a have reason to claim the network has represented the meaning of the sentence. So it's operationalized, it operationalizes sentence comprehension in terms of being able to answer questions about thematic role assignments. Okay? We're going to take a similar tact except we're going to, we're going to actually um, derive a representation of sentence meaning sort of independent of the actual sentence input. The St. John and McClellan simulation only had sentence input into the rep sentence meaning and then had to answer questions. Um, what we're going to do, what we did, is code the propositions uh, of a sentence in terms of relational triples uh, where the entities that enter into the triples have featural descriptions that capture some basic characteristics of them. Okay? So these are an example, this is an example for a sentence, the boy who's being chased by the fast dogs stole some apples in the park. The meaning of that sentence is decomposed into these four propositions. A boy stole an apple, um, the boy's, the dog's chasing the boy, the dog's fast, and the stealing took place in the park. And each of those, those fillers have certain feature descriptions. So, our claim is that if a system can regenerate these triples with their descriptions, then that constitutes having an understanding of the sentence. <coughs> um, we trained the net, uh, what you think of as an encoder network to derive a representation of those triples. Okay, what does that mean? Well, if a level of representation can receive those triples as input and then use the representation to reconstruct all the triples, then that, that must have the information in it. Okay? So that's exactly how this was trained. Nothing to do with language input. This is sort of what we would think of as watching the situation uh, and then having all the information that was relevant uh, that happened in the situation. Input triples were fed in over time over as a sequence and this, le this uh, level of representation was learned, uh, was trained to be able to um, take uh, incomplete triples and reconstruct them to be the full triple. Okay? So we would leave out components. Roughly analogous to having a component that says the dog chased the boy and you'd ask who chased the boy, what did the dog do, what did the dog do to the boy, things like that. We're leaving out components, the network has to use its representation to reconstruct those meanings. Okay? Um, when it is trained, um, if you ask how often does it get every exact triple, every feature of every triple right, um, it's a little over 92%. This is the comprehension part. This is not sentence processing yet. Okay? Um, 
it's got almost all of the units. That is to say, when it misses a triple, it usually misses a particular feature. Um, we looked in more detail at a subset of the language, a sub in this case a subset of the meanings, that um, were restricted to, set, restricted to those meanings conveyed by sentences less than 10 words or up to 10 words. Because many, some of the much longer sentences and most of these errors, as you can see, are misinterpretations or the inability to code the meanings of very complicated sentences, okay? um, which seem sort of unnecessarily complex for the point purposes of understanding sentence comprehension from our point of view. So if we look at these simpler, sen smaller sentences, they still have embeddings. They can have multiple embeddings. Um, this meaning, this way of encoding sentence meaning is more or less flawless, okay? So that is the means by which we derived representations uh, that are going to be the target representations for sentence comprehension. That training went as follows. We presented these words as input. We have um, both targets at the message level, that is to say we know what the, the, what the representation the network is supposed to be producing is there. Um, but we can also evaluate the network's message by more or less asking it questions, that is to say using it to try to fill in the various triples uh, that are involved in coding the meaning of the sentence. Okay? So comprehension training involves presenting an input, has to learn to map onto these meaning representations. Um, it is simultaneously uh, trying to generate predictions of the upcoming words over this uh, output layer. In addition, we provided the network with varying degrees of context for the sentence. Okay? <laughs> Language comprehension does not involve understanding isolated, unrelated sequences of sentences. There's usually some coherence in topic over sentences. Okay? We varied that by half of the time providing semantic information to the network prior to it hearing the sentence. Okay? So it's in some situation and it might have some bias to expect that the next utterance has something to do with this, this information. Okay? Some of the time it had no bias. It had to derive the meaning entirely from the words coming in. Sometimes it had some information uh, about what the upcoming, upcoming meaning is. This is relevant for the following reason. Um, when there's no information here, there's all of the, all of the um, onus of performance is on the language comprehension system to derive meaning from the input. And this can't help very much. And all of the prediction is based early on on the words and only later in the sentence by a combination of the words coming in and the partial meaning derived for those words. So with no initial bias, there's a strong sort of uh, tendency for the prediction to be largely sort of lexically driven or syntactically driven. In the contexts where there is context, sorry, in the, in the situations where there is prior information, the network can be much more accurate at its predictions, right? It in some sense has information about what the upcoming utterance is going to be about. And it can use that initial information to be much more accurate at generating its word predictions. So the mixture of context encourages the network to use its own meaning representation as much as possible in generating the sequence of words coming in for comprehension. Right? That indirectly trains the network for production. What happens during production? The network has its own meaning representation and it's going to use its meaning representation to drive the output system, in a sense, to predict what a real, uh, what a skilled speaker of the language would say in this context. 
It's had indirect training on that because it's been observing skilled users of the language speak the language in various contexts. And insofar as it uses that knowledge to improve its predictions, that knowledge transfers naturally to production. Okay? So before we talk about that, let me just show you, uh, in fact, on the comprehension side, if we're just asking how accurate is the network at, at responding to sentences, um, in, in the case that matters for sentence comprehension, the network is 96% correct at answering, deriving the appropriate triples uh, of the meanings of sentences. Okay? So that's, that's good, nice high accuracy in comprehending sentences. Um, of course, when it has a bit of context, it's a bit more accurate, but that's not surprising. Um, let me just uh, show you a little bit of data suggesting that um, not only has the network, not as only is the network showing accurate performance, um, but its relative ease at processing different kinds of sentences lines up roughly with what we know about people. Um, one set of studies that asked thematic role assignments in uh, embedded sentences looked at uh, center versus right branching subject and object relatives, actually a couple studies, and found um, roughly this order of performance. There's a little bit of disagreement here, um, but in general, the object extracted sentences are worse, were more poorly comprehended than the subject extracted sentences. Um, and uh, there's pretty good agreement that among the uh, subject extracted sentences, this, uh, the right embedded sentences are worse. Um, the model shows patterns largely compatible with this. Um, it turns out, at least in the model's vocabulary, this is a somewhat e obviously easier task. Uh, the, the range of possible answers are, are limited. The model is actually more accurate. Um, one thing to note here, people are surprisingly bad at answering questions about thematic role assignments in sentences. Um, we think people understand sentences like uh, the dog who John chased ate apples, but they actually uh, often don't. Um, the model luckily does a bit better, but also makes errors. But in any case, um, quite apart from that comment, the model is showing the relative sensitivities uh, to uh, different sentence types uh, as the subjects are. Uh, and we're looking, obviously, at this in much more detail. Finally, let me turn to production. Um, in this case, the model's not trained on production, remember. Um, we're simply loading up a set of triples uh, to create a message representation, then using that message representation to generate an initial prediction of the first word in the sentence. Um, in this case, it will, we will use the most active word as the utterance produced by the network and use that as the input to the network for the next cycle. It can now use, make the next prediction based on having said the first word and what its intended meaning is. Uh, and the answer is in doing so, without any training, it's 86.5% correct on producing the appropriate sequences of sentences uh, samples from the ones it can comprehend uh, as, uh, as, a, as an effect of doing this implicit prediction during comprehension. Um, so our interpretation of this is this, is this is like the extreme form of a late talker. Up to this point, the network has said nothing. It's gotten no feedback from production. And it finally opens its mouth, and it can produce grammatical utterances um, at a pretty high rate of performance. So, let me conclude. Theories of language learning have often claimed we need to start with a lot of built-in structure um, because of uh, limits in the amount of information available in the input and the complexity of the kinds of knowledge people ultimately need to derive. Um, and the simulations I've shown today are all very simplified relative to the kinds of constructions skilled language learners actually use and learn. So at one level, I haven't uh, in any direct sense contradicted the claim that if one really had to learn the full structure of the language, one would have to build in a lot of uh, additional constraints. On the other hand, in every case that I have looked at, 
the findings on hand have suggested that exactly the kinds of capabilities of these networks would also have required additional built-in structure uh, to learn. Long distance dependencies, multiple center embedding, multiple embeddings, various kinds of uh, agreement phenomena. The simulations are not in any sense really models of language performance. The last one starts to get close. They're more intended to be demonstrations of how certain principles, certain computational principles, standard connectionist types of ideas, combined with this particular additional assumption of implicit prediction, how these assumptions can allow simulations to exhibit behavior that looks like it goes beyond what, you built, what was built in in the initial structure. Okay? So it's not a refutation of the standard theory. It's intended to be re, uh, evidence that we need to be careful and to think, to rethink the extent to which we need to build in structure in order to account for the kinds of patterns we see in ling linguistic behavior. So in particular, this idea of using implicit prediction um, in answer to these questions is a means of exploiting the rich tradition, uh, statistical structure in the environment. It provides a possible basis for critical period effects that don't depend on maturational changes. Um, it is capable, at least in some contexts, of exhibiting what look like hard constraints not supported, at least not obviously supported by the input. Um, and uh, the possibility that production can bootstrap off comprehension uh, as a way of, uh, uh, of training. Thank you. I'll take questions. Sure. Any sort of staggered learning. Staggered learning. First, and then you try to learn another language and find the difficulties because you've had all this experience with the first language. Well, critical period effects refer to the data. That is to say, a comparison between the relative efficacy of learning. Right. The data is, that's what, that's what we, people mean by critical period. Effects. Right. And so that's independent of things like whether you had a first language. So cases like Genie, who was a five language. That's those right. Cases, those are critical period effects. And then that's right. people who, like me, were uh, deprived of second language learning experience opportunities until high school, that's the other kind of critical period effect where, where presumably I was, had passed this critical period. So you're suggesting that it's, but it's, that it's not a maturation issue, which is the way this is really common, the way it's wrong. It's just that in, the, in my case, I stag, tried to stagger my language work, and that's what got me into trouble. And if I hadn't staggered it, if I, if I had uh, done two some things, that would have been OK. Is that the character? Is that roughly? No, no, no. Hold on. There's, there's two effects. One is. When you started to learn your second language, you already knew a first language. That's the relevant That's effect. Sad. In the case of Jeannie, when she started to learn her first language, she had already used her cognitive resources to be doing all sorts of other things. That would be the explanation. Okay. That is the well, same. I, just, I, mean, I guess the, the question is, how much effort, how much accomplishment do you think count, uh, would qualify for having learned the first language? So for example, why isn't every Dutch person going to be a counterexample to your argument? I mean, you know, these are people who presumably, you know, have, you know, they learn Dutch um, uh, at home until they're four years old. They, and like every other four-year-old, they have roughly adult mastery of the language. And then they go to school and they start learning English and French and German. And they don't see, and, and 
Can I meet them in college? Is there indistinguishable from native speakers? So um, what's the, what is the, what's the difference? If you're asking whether there are, whether the data for poorer language learning when it's acquired later, that is to say these are, well, sorry, the, the, if, if speakers start learning language early, right, on this account, if it's sufficiently early enough, um, and there was a little bit of uh, data on this, um, That is to say, by age four or so, they start learning language. They, the claim would be that they are not um, necessarily going to be as good as native bilinguals from birth, but they'll still be far better than someone who's learned language very late. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, well. We can talk about that. Um, it depends partly what aspects of language we're talking about. So in phonology, um, I think there is good data suggesting that even a bit of early nonlingual uh, data does impact uh, ultimate, in most people, ultimate second language performance. There are, of course, vi violations of this. Um, that is so confounded with all sorts of things. Like, for example, if you had, if you learn another language very early on, if you continue to be exposed to that language and, and use that language as a primary language, then it wouldn't be totally shocking that the phonology of this language that you use most of the time is going to have some effect on the phonology. That's right, and and that's much of what uh, Fliege has shown. That, uh, in fact. Um, the quality of your second language phonological experience matters. So if you're a, a, a late bilingual, but you're a student getting most of your second language input from native speakers and having to use it with native speakers, your, your ultimate level of performance is much better than if you're the spouse of a student who lives at home, mostly spends time with other, others who are similar late bilinguals and getting much more impoverished language input. So I agree that the, the behavioral data here are, uh, are not clear cut uh, and that there are continuing effects of language exposure both after what people would call the critical period and in fact effects of how much language exposure there is before the critical period would end. Um, in some sense, what I take you to be saying is that this is a little too strong of a critical period effect relative to the kinds of effects one might see in well, I, people. I, actually, and I think that's probably yeah, right. I prefer your first slide where you were, your first one where you were showing, and I take it, that on these, on these sentences, your performance, this is, this is performance, your measure of performance on the, the so-called second. Yes. Um, that once, if you have exposure, sufficient exposure to um, a, prime, a first language, that appears to be quite traumatic. Right. Okay. The, um, and again, you can tell us whether that was an essence of or My my understanding of the literature, and it, again, it does depend partly on what aspects of language we're talking about, but certainly in the domain of phonology. Um, my interpretation of this is it's actually too strong of a critical period effect for a learner getting very clean phonological information from the second language. But there are lots of individual differences as well. Well, here's, here's the problem. 
The term critical period is it often is used to refer both to a, a sort of theory and a finding. Okay, the theory, it often refers to a, the theory that there's some physiological thing happening in the brain that is fine for four-year-olds and is not fine for 24-year-olds, okay? And, and therefore, four-year-olds learn language well and 24-year-olds don't. How about, how about nine and 15? Right, well, this is where things get complicated. So the critical period effects also refer to behavioral findings where one finds differences between populations in their performance on tasks as a function of age. Many of those studies confound age with a number of other factors, like time learning, the sec t amount of time spent on the second language, amount of time spent on the first language, the quality of the input of the second language, the amount they continue to use the first language. Um, and pulling these apart is, is difficult. Um, in some sense, an account of language learning needs to account for the, the way in which all those factors contribute to performance and whether or not the ultimate performance looks like a step curve or a slope or a straight line doesn't matter, right? What matters is explaining the observed data. Um, it's just that it's very different to be claiming that there is no critical period in the sense of behavioral description. But there's nothing to explain. That's a very different claim of saying this model explains the critical period effect. Um, I agree. Uh, the, I think there are, there are good demonstrations that when one controls for as much as possible these other confounding factors, the ones that have been looked at, one still does find a general decrement in language performance as a function of aid, language learning. Okay. So I don't think it's a step function. Um, but I do think that there is a factor, there, there is something to explain that relates to coming to the language task having already learned other stuff. Could be language, could be other things. Okay? I completely concur though that um, the classic characterization of the phenomena is really uh, much too simplistic and that the real phenomena here are more complex and are still kind of getting mapped out. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's, 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 right. So um, in the manipulation that I used, this late bilingual is getting 50% exposure to each language, okay? That is to say, you move to a new country, you continue to speak your native language with your spouse, say, but you're now learning the second language. Um, that's a pretty coarse approximation. Of course, things vary considerably. Um, there's actually some um, interesting data looking at children who are adopted, uh, which is into some new country that doesn't, where the parent, the adopting parents don't speak the, na the L1, the country, there's like very little opportunity to be exposed to L1, the child is not entering a community where there are speakers of L1. So it's a much better character, it's a much better um, situation of looking at what happens when you have experience in a language and then it stops, okay? Um, and the data there are, are harder to, interpret because of course your performance in L1 drops off to next to nothing. The question is how long lasting are the effects on L2, right? And um, I don't know this literature fully, but my understanding of what I've looked at is they, they, it's kind of an intermediate case. That is to say your performance in L2 is better having no experience, no continuing experience with L1 than in often the standard kinds of tests where you do have some continuing experience with L1, a standard late bilingual moving to a new country. Um, whether these, these adopted kids ultimately achieve complete native mastery is, I don't think, yet documented very well. Um, in this, if, I can tell you what happens in the simulation, which is uh, if you completely stop training on L1 and train only on L2, um, you will gradually lose your ability to do any predictions in L1. 
with a little bit of L1 exposure, you'll get it back pretty quickly. So relearning is very rapid, but you will show substantial interference to your first language, learning only a second and never using your first. Yeah. So I'm inclined to think that the first two experiments that we recorded as being about the initial conditions under which it's possible to, the initial settings of the waves, the initial point of parameter space, in which it's possible to learn the language. And I'm curious what you think the subset of the parameter space from which exposure to English will cause you to learn English looks like. Um, because at the beginning it sounded like you were saying I mean, these two things, the first two experiments aren't incompatible, but on the face of it, it's sort of a surprising contrast. That uh, at the beginning you were saying, well, if you start too close, to, if the weights will start too small, then you don't learn it. Right. If the weights are big and random, then you learn it. But if the weights are big and are really big and random and German, then you don't learn it. Right. right. So, so, so what is it special about, about the German weights? Are they self reinforcing the event from the body? Exactly. That is to say, uh, your continued exposure to German prevents those weights from adapting to something that can do both English and German. Because of course, as you start to learn, as you start to try to incorporate English, you're going to be much, much worse at German if you just let the weights adapt. That's what will happen uh, in answer to the, the previous question, that your L1 language will get much worse if you only, if you only learn on L2. Oh, and you actually have done that experiment. I, maybe I misunderstood you. Um, I've done it in other contexts. No, I haven't actually run it here. I can't say that I have. But um, I've, I've, I've run that basic manipulation. And in fact, if, if any of you are familiar with this phenomenon called catastrophic interference, it's exactly what this is. That is to say, sure. although the degree to which it's catastrophic can vary with parameters. Uh, if you learn something and then never rehearse it, you'll lose it. And you'll right. lose it pretty rapidly. You also it. Right. Have... Right. In the if course of learning something new. I mean, I don't know what learning algorithm you're using for this, but I assume um, it's, it's just like all this background. Yeah, this is, um, all of these were with backpropagation with the exception, not an exception, with the augmentation that the critical period effects actually to get them to be substantial. And in fact, I agree, maybe they shouldn't be so substantial uh, when one, if one looked at a behavioral context exactly analogous to the network. Um, but in any case, they're certainly amplified uh, insofar as the learning algorithm combines properties of heavy and learning with the with the error correcting of back propagation. So yeah, I just want to point out that presumably there's going to be a lot of maximum that might sometimes prevent you from getting that much. Right. And in fact you can think of the, the bilingual training as exactly like that. The, the continued training on, on German is reinforcing this local minima or maxima with regards well, to you English. Can get it to the right. Exactly. Yeah? Uh, do you think that the, um, the degree of interference between L1 and L2 uh, is affected by the capacity of the network, the number of hidden units? Uh, you could imagine that if you used enough, if you used more hidden units, you might have a point where it can learn L1, but without using all the hidden units, maybe, and then when L2 and L1 come along, it can use those unused units to do really well. Um, you'd expect if you have way too many hidden units, I suppose, that it wouldn't really generalize well. But I guess I'm asking whether you know, adding a little more capacity would uh, um, reduce the interference. It probably would reduce it somewhat. Um, and it's true, one of the interesting aspects of the, the phenomena are that there are some pretty substantial individual differences. There are some late learners, again, mostly I know the phonological data, there are some late learners that really do become indistinguishable from natives. And so it is sort of tempting to imagine that they somehow bring additional representational resources to bear and have the flexibility to, to, to dis distinguish the um, phonological spaces. But um, part of what drives the effect here is that the, the, is the assumption that the phonological representation, the, the sort of acoustic space in which speech is occurring, is the same for the two languages. And so you sort of can't avoid one interfering with the other. 
it's not really a matter, of, it's not a matter of having a room, it's sort of a matter of they're both being represented in the same input space and then having to have very different implications. Uh, and that's a very hard thing for networks to do. It's, they can take very different things and map them onto similar outcomes, but it's very hard to take very similar things and map them onto very different outcomes. So I wouldn't expect that alone would, would kind of eliminate the effect. Yes? The uh, hard versus soft constraints experiment. I mean, it seemed like the data you were showing here showed that it was true that the network could make a distinction between grammatical and ungrammatical things. And that's great. Right. I mean, you can do that. Okay. It'd be very different. But implicit in the hard versus soft formulation is sort of qualitative difference in judgments or behavior or something. And that's what I was about how you thought that if you if you agree first with there is a qualitative difference between hard and soft constraints and second how the network what's the sort of threshold statistical threshold to pass well I don't really think there is a hard a difference between hard and soft constraints. Um, I think if if you were looking for behavioral data that suggested people were almost perfect at distinguishing these sentences as ungrammatical from similar sentences, then this, this kind of difference in distribution, like blue versus red, basically, pretty close. It's sharper than the behavioral data that support the claims in the first place. So um, at one level, there's almost, there are almost no behavioral phenomena that are really all or none. Um, but this is mostly intended to demonstrate that the network can derive or could derive performance in discriminating these sentences that are pretty close to near perfect performance without having ever been told they weren't grammatical. Yeah. I have a question actually on the, the native bilingual. Why did you why did you switch every fifty sentences and not like every other sentence? I mean, clearly a hundred sentences when you get into the um, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, in fact, there are these code switching kinds of issues having to do with switching languages within sentences that once you've learned the languages, you can do this pretty, eff pretty efficiently. And you implied that there is uncertainty I don't think so substantially, although I haven't done it. Because here's, here's what's relevant. The network needs to know what language it's speaking in order to know what predictions it's making. And German sentences and German constructions are very strongly, reliably predictive of other German words and constructions. And so the network learns that. If you really were switching back and forth between languages at a very fine granularity, um, it's hard to know the extent to which there really are two languages going on, you know, operating here. Um, so the claim would be that you couldn't, it would be very hard to learn language from input that was very tightly code switching all the time. But having learned languages from more, sub, more extended utterances in each language, you could then use it that way. Where that boundary is, where the system could still pull these apart sufficiently or not, I don't know. That would require some additional work. Um, but I do think there's, there are different, different demands here on learning relative to performance. Okay, thank you very much.